Hey, Bob. Bob, look at the clock. It says 25 minutes. Oh, no, six. it doesn't, Warren. That's where you're wrong. Shows you don't understand clock language. What that clock is saying is, hey, you actors, it's coffee time at Maxwell House again. Can't you smell that wonderful fragrance? Why don't you take time out for a moment and have a delicious cup of coffee? <laughs> well, Bob, when it's Maxwell House that's being served, I guess even an actor would be glad to stop and have a cup. And friends, once again, we invite you all, all over the country, to join us in this famous old Thursday evening custom. A moment's relaxation over a steaming, fragrant cup of Maxwell House coffee. Pull up your chairs, folks, and have your coffee with us. Everybody served? Now, here's sugar and cream. And Meredith, let's have music. We pause briefly for station identification. This is KFI Los Angeles. This is Bob Young again, and we continue our Good News Maxwell House program with the Hardy family, Melissa Corgis, Baby Snooks, and the rest of the Good News gang. And now the MGM Theater of the Air takes special pleasure in presenting a glimpse of the latest adventures of Judge Hardy's family. The newest picture, The Hardy's Ride High, the screenplay of which was written by Agnes Christine Johnson, William Ludwig, and Kay Van Riper from an original story by Kerry Wilson. <laughs> In the private chambers of Judge Hardy's court, the judge is busy with a pile of legal papers on his desk when the bailiff enters with a strange gentleman. Gentlemen to see you, Judge. Good afternoon, Judge Hardy. My card. Jonas Brownell, attorney at law, Detroit, Michigan. Well, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Brownell. What can I do for you? Judge, are you the great-great-grandson of Colonel James Standish Leeds, a well-known figure of the War of 1812? Yeah, so they've been telling me for a good many years. Why? Well, if you can prove it legally, you're the heir to something more than $2 million. $2 million? Well, that's a lot. $2 million? Are you crazy? Well, I didn't come all the way from Detroit to establish my insanity. Uh, oh. Did you or did you not say $2 million? $2 million. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. Uh, but, Mr. Brownell, whoever's leaving me this fortune... Why, a, a retired capitalist of Detroit, James S. Leeds III. Oh, didn't he have any children? No, none of his own. It's true, there's an adopted son, Philip. But since Mr. Leeds left no will, you merely have to prove that you're a blood relative to have first claim on the estate. Well, that sounds kind of hard on this young Philip. Oh, the old man set up a trust fund for the boy. Just between us, I think he might have willed him the estate if Philip hadn't been... Uh, shall we say, too much involved with the wrong kind of people. Wrong kind of people? Notably, a certain rather notorious chorus girl by the name of Consuela McNish, a young lady who'd set fire to an orphan asylum for 50 cents and give you a quarter change. Oh, Judge, Judge, I just got a phone call from the football field. We're taking a beating. It's the last quarter, and the score is Olympia 6, Carvel High nothing. Oh, oh, excuse me, Judge, I forgot you had a visitor. You know, it's a funny world, Mr. Brownell. I doubt it to my son, Andrew, whose allowance is a dollar and a half a week, even two million dollars, will make up for losing his first game of high school football. All unaware of his father's astounding good fortune, Andy Hardy comes tearing down a resident street of Carvel and up the steps of Polly Benedict's house. Hey, Polly! Oh, hello, Andy. Polly, we made a touchdown in the last three minutes of play. Well, that's wonderful, Andy. Oh, why didn't you come to the game like you promised? Well, I'm sorry, but I had an unexpected guest. You know, that boy I met last vacation, the one from the Boston school, Dick Bannersley. Huh? Come in, I want you to meet him. Uh, this is Mr. Hardy, Mr. Bannersley. Very happy to meet you, I'm sure, Mr. Hardy. Huh? Oh. Yeah, happy to meet you, too. Well, uh, why don't you sit down, Mr. Bannersley, or, or are you leaving right away? <laughs> well, it, it seems to me that I've heard it said that gentlemen remain standing until the lady is seated. Oh, I'm sorry, Polly, I forgot. Besides, I can't ever think of you as being a lady. 
Uh, oh, I, I mean, uh, I mean, excuse me. You know what I mean. Uh, well, I don't mind saying I'm famished. Well, me neither. Me neither. <laughs> A glass of lemonade, dear? Uh, here's yours, Andy. Oh, here's some cookies. Oh, boy, homemade raisin cookies. I'll take three just to start with. Uh, mind if I uh, smoke, Polly? No, of course not. Have a cigarette, Hardy? No. Nope. Hmm. Don't smoke, eh? Me? Oh, sure I do. <laughs> you don't either, Andy. <laughs> uh, well, that's all you know. I'm very particular about the brand I smoke. Some more lemonade, Dick? Oh, no. Uh, but I could improve this with a shot of gin. Gin? Oh, I'm, I'm afraid we haven't any in the house. Say, haven't you ever seen those pictures in the physiology books that shows what that gin and whiskey does to the lining of your stomach? Oh, <laughs> why, you don't take that bosh. Seriously, do you, old man? Me? Sure, I'm in training for football. Say, I haven't told you, Polly. You should have seen our touchdown. 47 yards and eight plays. We zipped uh, That's swell, Andy. Uh, <laughs> do you play football, Dick? No, uh... No, my, my governor won't let me. According to him, all I'm going to school for is to get poised. Well, uh, poise will be poise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, uh, well, don't you see, Dick, uh, boys will be boys, boys will be boys? No, it just doesn't make me laugh, but definitely. Better try again, Andy. You know, puns are the lowest form of wit. Yeah, well, I can think of things a lot lower. Well, I gotta go, Polly. Can I see you outside for a loan a minute? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Excuse huh? me. So long, bud. Nice to have met you, Hardy. But definitely, Dick. <laughs> Polly, remember what you promised me if we won the game? Oh, I did promise you a kiss, didn't I? Oh, well. All right. Go ahead. Say, hey, what goes on here? You act as if I'd never kissed you before. Come here. Oh, you hiding. Why do you always be so crude? Say, hey, I don't get it. Oh, can't you be a little more subtle? Can't you approach a girl with a little more finesse? Finesse? You mean like fancy pants in there does, huh? <laughs> Well, not me. I'm a guy that goes direct for action. Now, come here and give me that kiss. <laughs> oh, I begin, I begin to get the idea. I'm all right until some lottie da Lizzie like Dick Bannersley comes along. Well, that's not it at all. But I should think that you'd rather model yourself on a man of the world instead of a hoodlum. Oh, a hoodlum, huh? Then why don't you try going steady with fancy pants instead of hoodlum? Well, I certainly might prefer anybody to someone who goes around grabbing girls and kissing them. Andrew, Andrew Hardy. Yes, Miss Benedict? Your father just phoned from the courthouse. He wants you to go home at once. Yes, Miss Benedict. Then good afternoon, Mr. Hardy. Hmm. A man of the world, huh? Oh, how can a guy be a man of the world in a buck and a half a week? <laughs> The door of the Hardy home is burst open by the usually calm Judge Hardy in a high state of dither, almost hysterical in his anxiety to tell Mrs. Hardy, daughter Marion, and Andy about the two million dollars. Whoopee, mother! Whoopee, Marion, Andy! Mom, look at Dad! Father! James, what's the matter? I couldn't understand a word you said over the phone. Look at me, Emily. Do I look different? Well, there's some dust on your coat sleeve and your hair's mud. No, no, don't mean that. I mean, can't you see that I'm a different man? Oh, James, come on in the den and lie down. You'll feel better in a minute. Emily, you're seeing me a man who has miraculously watched his dreams come true. The most amazing... Andy, how'd you like to go to an exclusive Eastern boys school? Not me. I hate rich kids. James Hardy, what is the matter? You're talking foolish. Well, and you'd talk foolish, too, if the moon slid down right out of the sky and landed smack in your lap. Marion... How do you like to have an ermine coat? An ermine coat? Mother, he is sick. Oh, now, James, please, dear, sit down. Oh, James, you're delirious. You're feverish. Yes, I am delirious. I am feverish. Oh, now, dear, please don't take on so. We all love you. We'll take care of you. Ah, Mother, now, 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 you sit down. Now, Mary and Andy, you brace yourselves. I've just learned that I am the sole heir to two million dollars. Two million bucks? Pop's gone haywire. Let's get Doc Jones. Humor him, Mother. Don't argue with him. Now, wait, wait a minute, everybody. Wait a minute. I'm in full possession of my senses. It's true. And I must go to Detroit to support my claim. And if I do it successfully, they'll give us the two million. Dad, 
Then we're rich, really rich. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Oh, isn't that nice? And I've been worrying about trifling little matters like small-town clothes. Hey, this is going to make a big change in my plans. Yes, a miracle's come our way at last. Two million bucks. See, I'm going to start in right now insulting everybody I know. <laughs> yes, sir, let me tell you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get myself a big yacht and, and maybe a string of racehorses. I hope we'll all know how to act in our new position in life. Well, our... no, I don't think I'd start counting our chickens before the hatch. It might turn out we won't get the money. Oh, that's just your natural conservatism, Dad. Look, let's make a deal. You know, 50-50. You do the worrying about getting the money, and I'll do the worrying about spending it. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Hardy, millionaire playboy. Ah, that's me from now on. 